Dr. Noah Bryan, uh, PGY4, for those who don't know me. Uh, this is, I think, the third or fourth of the uh, kind of controversies and debates that is a new topic this year by uh, Dr. Dishita, Dr. Kim, Dr. Benavis, and Dr. Allen. Uh, and so our debate is to antibios or not to antibios. That is the question for the uncomplicated abscess. We have no disclosures, no antibiotic money, no nothing. Uh, and just to acknowledge the uh, debates and controversy team. So we sent out a little faculty survey just to see where our faculty stood on this topic before we kind of discuss some of the, the evidence and kind of debate each other a little bit. So for a fairly simple, uncomplicated patient, uh, young male, no past medical history with a localized abscess, the vast majority of our attendings decide that they will just do an IMD, but a small, you know, 12% of them want to get some MRSA coverage and IMD. And if you make that patient a little older, it adds a little bit more of a mix where some people want to start adding on uh, probably Teflex, I'm guessing, if they're saying give a set of foreign. And then you make the person an IBDU, it shifts it the other way. Almost everybody wants to give MRSA coverage. And then you add in, you know, some erythema to the area. So I think people are thinking some associated cellulitis. And again, that kind of makes it a little bit more mixed with IND, some antibiotics alone, and some uh, IND and MRSA coverage. And make the person a little sicker and older, more people want to get antibiotics, but still a lot of people want to IND alone and nothing else. And now we're to somebody who recently maybe was prescribed some antibiotics. That pushes people over but still a lot of IND alone. And a young person, even, you know, once you're saying they have MRSA culture recently, then it shifts to a majority as well of giving antibiotics, but still a lot of IND alone. So, Dr. Pan. All right, so just like a brief overview of why we're talking about this topic, um, so skin and soft tissue infections are among the most common traits seen in the ER with abscesses representing nearly half of all cases, and the incidence is only increasing each year. Staph aureus is the most common organism affected with these infections, and in the U.S., about well, 59% of patients with SSTI were infected with community associated MRSA. So we all know the standard clinical uh, management and treatment of simple abscesses is incision and drainage, but the role of adjuvant antibiotics after IND of these uncomplicated abscesses remains controversial, and the practice of prescribing antibiotics is pretty variable, as you can see from the faculty survey results. So the current practice guidelines for this, from the Infectious Disease Society of America state that drainage is sufficient for many patients. Uh, the guidelines basically recommend average of antibiotics only for patients with specific associated conditions that might indicate a complicated abscess. So that means anyone who meets the service criteria has markedly impaired post defenses, if they have a current infection, patients at extremes of age, get an abscess in an anatomical location that precludes adequate drainage, or if they fail to improve after IND alone. So based on the IDSA guidelines, they don't really recommend antibiotics for uh, uncomplicated abscesses, and previous studies from the past also came to the same consensus. But a lot of these studies did have multiple limitations. So for one, they were small sample sizes and underpowered. Uh, one meta-analysis included retrospective, prospective, observational, and random control trial data. So that uh, made its findings less reliable due to numerous confounding factors. And, and then a lot of studies in the past have looked at trials comparing cephalosporins, such as cephalexin, against MRSA, and those who prefer benefit against MRSA, which, as mentioned, is most commonly found in us. <laughs> so, in contrast to the previous underpowered small trials, the uh, recently in 2016 and 2017, there were two large randomized controlled trials. 
published that shows benefits when antibiotics are added to the standard therapy of astrocytosis. So both included oral antibiotics against MRSA in addition to IND, were superior to IND alone, and that they confer the major benefit of improved cure rates. So with the inclusion of these two new studies, now the question is, what's the updated review of the evidence regarding the use of seven antibiotics to treat uncomplicated aspects of IND? And what's the number needed to treat and the number needed to harm? So in 2018, Gottlieb et al. published a systematic review and a meta-analysis, and they looked at four trials and asked the question, do MRSA active antibiotics improve clinical outcomes among patients with a draining skin access? And the overarching answer they got was yes. And in their data, they had a MRSA problems about about 49% and I'm going to say of 63 So just a quick background at studies that they looked at. These were four randomized placebo-controlled studies. All were determined to get overall low risk of bias. It included 2,406 participants. And as you can see, so two of the studies were the two recent RCTs that showed benefit of antibiotics by Callan and Jow. And these two RCTs also have a significantly large number of patient subjects compared to the other two, which definitely influenced the meta-analysis results, but it also increased the study's power to detect small to moderate effects. So of these four studies, Schmitz and Talon looked at mostly at adult populations, Duong looked at pediatric populations, and Dong looked at both adults and pediatrics. Three of the studies compared TMPS and extra placebo, while Dong randomized eight patients in a one to one to one ratio, interested in clindamycin, TMPS, and extra or placebo. So, the primary outcome that they looked at was treatment failure. So, the definition of treatment failure was mostly similar among the four studies. All definitions included the appearance of clinical signs and symptoms that indicated a worsening or lack of resolution of the lesion. The Talon study defined treatment failure by just clinical signs and symptoms, whereas the other three included clinical signs and symptoms, as well as the need for further interventions, such as repeated IND, changing antibiotics, and hospital admission. And then all of those studies required specific assessment of the wound within 21 days. So the big takeaway from uh, the two trials by Talon and Down, as well as the meta-analysis, is that there was decreased treatment failure in the antibiotic group, um, with 89 treatment failures and then 150 treatment failures in the placebo group. So 7.7% and 16.1% respectively. And the calculated risk difference was 7.4% in favor of the antibiotic group. And this was found to be statistically significant with an NNT of 14. So 14 patients have to have been treated with the drug for one treatment failure. So going into the two trials by John and Helen, they both brought up a couple of significant points in regards to the cure rate with antibiotic use. Like I mentioned, uh, down randomized patients to clindamycin, TMPS, and placebo in a one to one to one ratio. And they found that the cure rates for patients treated with IND plus either antibiotic were significantly higher than that among participants who were treated with IND plus placebo. However, they did find a significant difference in the cure between clindamycin and TMPS. Uh, both children and adults benefited from active therapy, although clindamycin was found to perform better than TMPS as a maximum children. So this trial basically showed that clindamycin is just as effective as TMPS and in treating on complicated abscesses. And they also found that uh, TMPS and X was effective, was effective at half the dose that was used by Talon study. So Talon study just looked at TMPS and X versus placebo in the mostly adult population. They then did a further analysis to determine the relative efficaciousness of antibiotics across two different subgroups. And so what they found was that the cure rates are higher for those treated with antibiotics than those treated with placebo, regardless of the abscess cavity size, erythema dimension, past MRSA infection, presence of fever, and the presence of diabetes or other major infections. <laughs> so basically they showed that there is an outcome advantage with antibiotics that existed across different lesion sizes, and that not only do antibiotics appear beneficial for the conditions that the IDSA selectively recommends this kind of treatment, but they also have a positive treatment effect on healthy patients. 
And then for both studies, uh, they noted that the magnitude of the treatment effect was greatest among the subgroups that had an active cause of MRSA, had a history of previous MRSA infection and fever. Um, another outcome that was in favor of antibiotics is that there is a decreased incident of new lesions. So in a meta-analysis by Holly, they found that new lesions at a different site were found in 68 patients in the antibiotic group and 134 in the three days. So 6.2% and 15.3% That they had a calculated risk difference of 10% that was also statistically significant in favor of fewer new lesions in the antibiotic group, and they came up with an NNT of 10. Um, this outcome was noted in all the individual studies as well. And then additionally, the Talon study found that even at follow-up at 49 to 63 days after the course of treatment, there was still a statistically significant difference between the antibiotic group and the group. So as expected, uh, there was an increase in events in the antibiotic group compared to the placebo group. So there was 327 in the antibiotic group and 233 in the placebo group, so 24.8 and 22.2% respectively. So they calculated this difference of 4.4% and a number needed to harm of 23. However, if you look at most of the common adverse events that participants experienced, the effects were pretty mild and self-limiting. So GI symptoms and diarrhea were among the most common, as you'd expect. The authors of the meta-analysis actually did a specific subgroup analysis, looking at the incidence of diarrhea between the antibiotic group and the procedure group, and they found that there was no statistical difference in occurrence rates. Uh, no cases of CDF were found in any of the four trials, and the two large trials are done by Down and Down. They routine clinical monitoring for CDF infection. They didn't find uh, occurrence of it in any treatment plan. Other uh, adverse events that were reported included mild rashes, drowsiness, headache, all of which self result. There were only two cases out of the 2400 with hypersensitivity reaction to the TNT-SMX, and they didn't identify any serious or life-threatening reactions such as Stephen Johnson syndrome. And SGS itself is quite rare with an estimated rate of three cases per 100,000 exposed persons. So, like I mentioned, the major benefit of antibiotics is improved clinical rate of the primary lesion, but there are benefits that extend beyond the care of initial lesion. So, as mentioned, it results in a, a decreased occurrence of new skin infection at different sites. It also results in a decreased occurrence of additional drainage procedures required. A decreased occurrence of similar infection in other household members. And it also results in a decreased tenderness, which is probably something that we don't think too much about, but something that is important to the patient and their quality of life. And so these were outcomes that were found by Talon's study, uh, and all were found to be statistically in favor of the end. And then finally, um, antibiotic use can also lead to decreased staph aureus colonization. So as mentioned, Staph aureus is the most common organism found in skin and soft tissue infections. It colonizes the anterior nerves and skin at multiple anatomic sites. So colonized individuals are at risk for subsequent infections and are also important sources for transmission, especially with, within households. As Talon found, uh, patients who receive antibiotics have decreased infections among household members. And this is in line with the findings of another study that found patients who received evidence of antibiotics with MRSA activity after IND and lower rates of staph aureus colonization at follow up, and they also had a decreased rate of recurrent infection. Um, and again, this has also been found in studies that were done in Greece and the Netherlands, where MRSA has a algorithm that included systemic antibiotics and to put reducing charge. So in summary, uh, in terms of benefits of giving antibiotics after IND, it can lead to improved clinical cure rate in both children and adults, decreased incidence of recurrent infections and new lesions in both children and adults, which can lead to decreased return visits and need for repeated IND. It can lead to decreased incidence of infection rates in household members, decreased staph aureus colonization, and then altogether, it can lead to a decreased cost of treatment failure and lower socioeconomic cost.
Thank you, Tina. All right, so is Gina right? Uh, I think no, that's actually a character that says no. Um, so this is the kind of classic Latin phrase describing how you should manage uh, abscesses. So where there's pus, you evacuate it. So you cut it open and you drain it out. Um, there's other ways, some people put packing in, some people do loop drainages, but removing you know, source control is kind of the gold standard of caring for abscesses and has been since all the way going back to ancient Roman Greek times, like probably before people for doctors and treating stuff, and it seems to work really well. And up until these systematic reviews, is actually what uh, ASAP recommended. Uh, the systematic reviews came out and then they removed them as their recommendations, but they didn't take up uh, Gina's point of giving everybody MRSA coverage. So first, this is a major issue, antibiotic stewardship. I think we all know about this. We've been lectured about trying to be more responsible with our antibiotic usage. And the reason is because these are common things, as Gina mentioned, and as you can see, it's extremely common and even more common that dash line is for people who are HIV uh, positive individuals. So this is a huge issue. Um, if you give everybody antibiotics, you risk creating um, resistance. And so that's why we try and do better antibiotic stewardship. This is a real meta-analysis, uh, many, many, many studies, and it shows, just kind of zooming into the very bottom, that there is an association with increased antibiotic prescribing and increased antibiotic resistance amongst bacteria. So we're trying to treat the very antibiotic resistant organisms with something that increases their rate of prevalence within our communities. So we're kind of this cycle, endless cycle of giving people more antibiotics with broader coverage and increasing the amount of resistant bacteria. So if we keep giving people MRSA coverage of antibiotics, then we're gonna push people towards things like other resistant to clindamycin to TMP SMX. Um, so that's like the biggest flaw I think in these two meta-analyses that they're pushing for this idea that everybody should be getting essentially pretty broad spectrum antibiotic coverage that we should be reserving for people who we know have MRSA, not for everybody just because of increasing community acquired rates of MRSA. If you work at maybe MIMO, so I'm sure uh, Dr. Gennaro is here, and I suspect there they have a much higher community acquired MRSA rate than we do at County and you know, that's a little different. And this is just to show that this is a not a class specific thing. It's across all antibiotics in any class. If you prescribe antibiotics, you're going to increase resistance. Some classes are a little worse than others, but trying to reduce your amount of antibiotic prescribing is the responsible thing to do. Um, and we should be looking at this as like a whole population and how our ability to treat serious infections and worsening resistance is comes back to individual patients that we do one step at a time and how to choose what to describe them. So with meta-analysis, they're kind of the best, right? We take a bunch of studies and we look at them and we combine their data so we have an even larger end, but crap in is kind of crap out. Um, that's the problem with any study with your quality of your data. And I'll just bring those up again um, to studies, which are really large, is really what these meta-analyses are of, right? The other ones are small. They show no significance difference. This is from uh, Gottlieb. And you can see that it's like 75 and 70 and like, or 102 and 88 in one. Like they're small studies relative to Taylor and Down. So that's what we're basing this on is really two studies. And then really down half of the patients or a third of the patients got clindamycin. The other third got TMP-SMX. So it's not quite the same thing. All those other studies in Gottlieb are TMP-SMX. So we're not comparing apples to apples, right? We're comparing apples, oranges to like other things. So they're not completely the same. Wong is another uh, systematic, systematic review meta-analysis that was done based on those same ones. They added in 
a few studies for clindamycin because the other ones don't. They wanted to look at clindamycin, but they're actually pretty old. If you look, they're like 1970, 1978. That's before community acquired MRSA was pretty common. So I would say even more so, it's hard to, like, why are we even doing a meta-analysis for one study for clindamycin when we're comparing it to two studies that we know aren't going to be terribly effective? So the first thing I wanted to kind of bring up about problems with these meta-analyses is intention to treat and per protocol. I think we all learn about this, and one of the things you get to think about is you can do a great RCT. You can randomize your groups really well and get perfectly equal groups, which if you look at table one of both tailing and down, they seem to do a pretty good job. But they have a lot of loss to follow up or people that are kind of removed from the studies. And so when you do an intention to treat, the problem with that is you actually break your randomization. But you want to do an intention to treat because an intention to treat analysis allows you, <coughs> sorry, allows you to kind of overestimate or underestimate the effect because you're saying everybody who you lost, who you're removing from your analysis was a negative outcome. And because you want to, when you do an RCT, you want to really say, this is something that we're only going to say is a positive study if it's positive. We don't want to take some guesses. But a lot of people like to do these modified intention to treats, which is what Talon does. They take some people who never actually got treated. And even though they were randomized, they just remove them. And they say, well, they never got their meds. Well, how many of our patients get their meds? We might give them one dose in the ED, but they don't get their meds. But they don't look at those patients at all. They don't even treat them as being negatives. Then you do a per protocol analysis, and this is great because you get to say, oh, everybody who I look at actually got treated. I actually followed them up so I can say I know what happened. And if you look at the denominators and the meta analyses, they're actually using the per protocol numbers. They're not using the intention to treat numbers. So you're overestimating potentially, you're risking saying that there is an effect, that there is a difference, but it's not actually there. So I think when you're trying to decide which one you're gonna do <clears throat> per protocol or intention to treat, if you wanna have a positive outcome, if you wanna make your thing look good, you choose per protocol. If you wanna be maybe more honest and risk incorrectly saying that there's no effect, then you choose intention to treat. So I think the meta-analysis authors, the authors of these papers like to push the per protocol numbers. So the other issue so, is heterogeneity, right? So in Wong, there's two really old studies. They don't all use the same TMPS and X dose as Gina mentioned. So Talon used this like double dose. Maybe that's why they had a slightly higher rate of actual adverse events for them compared to uh, down. And maybe they also had they also had like a little bit better outcomes for their like compared from to the placebo, maybe because they used a higher dose. So they're not again apples to apples. Down also looks at clindamycin and TMPSMX. So again, not apples to apples. They don't use the exact same periods of follow up. They don't use the same failure endpoints. So Talon only says it has to, for their primary outcome, it's that same lesion. Down says, oh, if you have a lesion anywhere else during our treatment of cure phase, you're actually gonna count as a failure. So I don't know if you wanna count those things just because you got a distal lesion. I don't know if I agree with Gina's point about decolonization, especially with systemic antibiotics. I think another option is you can do mebrosin, nasal swabs, you can do bleach baths. These are other things that the IDSA promotes and pushes for families especially. So problem two, figure one. This is every single RCT has. Um, this tells you what they did with their groups. And you can see how many people dropped out, right? They went from 636 patients in the TMPS and X group to 524 in their per protocol. They never actually do an analysis of that 636. They do the modified intention to treat because those six people never got treatment. And they're literally handing people packets. So they're randomized, they give them pills, 
or they're randomized and somehow they just disappear. So you're losing a lot of patients. And that breaks your randomization, as I mentioned before, and they don't give you the numbers for the randomization of what it looks like after they do that. So you might not have a real random sampling, especially in that per protocol analysis, right? You might be losing specific populations. That also makes you lose people who have adverse events. This is just for down. Oh, I think that. Sorry, this is down as well. Um, this is down. The one thing here is like they actually do a really good accounting for, they do an intention to treat, not a modified intention to treat. Um, but you can see they still lose a fair number of people, but it's fewer than the tail end, it's a smaller study. The one thing is the math, that first line, the 22, 24, and 41, doesn't really add into any of their numbers and it's not accounted for specifically in either the supplement or in their paper. So I don't know if there's people that maybe were randomized that somehow got removed. It's, they say that that's their total randomization. But just going through there, I can't figure out mathematically where that 41, 24, and 22 really come in. So the measure of failures that I mentioned, they're different, right? Tailing checks all the way up to 63 days for this like distal lesions. Uh, down just goes to 40 days, they do three checks. And again, like if you have a new abscess somewhere else, is that the same thing? Did you really fail treatment because you developed an abscess somewhere else, even if your original lesion was, was great? So who benefited? benefited? Um, again, down at the test of cure, most failures are distant sites. They weren't actually localized, like that same lesion recurred. Children only benefited, Clinda was good and down. Children benefited with Clinda a little better. Adults, maybe a little better with TMPS and X. Um, and if you look at down, down gives a lot of really great data of who benefited for each group they were looking at. It's really only MRSA. So staph aureus benefits, but then when you, they break it down even further, Staph aureus only benefits in the per protocol analysis with clindamycin, not even with TNPFS. So MRSA benefits across all uh, methylcellulose ses sensitive, sorry, MSSA, only clinda per protocol. MRSA is only like 50% of the patient population. So it's a coin flip, right? Maybe 50% of your patients might benefit if you're just randomly cutting an antibiotic. And the other 50%, if they get a harm, even if it's not huge, well, they didn't have any benefit. So this is just down for who actually got new infections. And you can see, if I can, there. So you have a worsening original lesion versus a new infection. And almost all the failures in the placebo, 32 versus five, were at a new infection site, not the same site. So I think that's something to consider. And it's the same thing in the one month follow-up. It's almost all the distal sites. Almost everybody was cured at one month. So just something to consider. And then this is the other table I was mentioning. As you can see, this is the whole group, everybody. And there is a benefit overall. This is what they look at for the, uh, and this is the PERC protocol. And this is what they're putting into the meta-analysis. This is just for children, as you can see, clindamycin. It's actually a good choice. Bactrim, TMPSMX, on the PERC protocol. This is all staph aureus, seems to benefit. MRSA definitely benefits. But when you look at MSSA, it's only clindamycin has actual significance in PERC protocol. And then for all other species, that's going to have no benefit. So you have half your population MSSA and not staff has no benefit. So I'm not sure for 50% of your patients, it's worth giving you no know, systemic antibiotics. There is harm, and I think Gina talked about this a little bit. Most of it is GI. The studies themselves admit it, and the meta-analyses say it, is they're not powered for C. diff. C. diff rates are too low in these numbers to get enough C. diff cases to say that there's any difference. TMP SMX actually had better side effect profile than Clinda in this group, but it had two 
in the meta-analysis, pretty severe reactions. They didn't die, but they were rated by them as severe reactions. They had like thrombocytopenia, they had fever, rash, hepatitis. That's somebody who's probably getting admitted, who's added costs to the healthcare system. And you also have to look at older patients don't do well generally on TMPSMX. Uh, so you're going to get them Clinda. Um, if you have a population like ours with a decent G6PD population, TMPSMX is also can be pretty bad. I don't know what their population was like in terms of incidence and prevalence of G6PD. And you can also get like Stephen Johnson syndrome, again, not powered for those, but they did see two serious adverse reactions in TMPSMX. Clinda actually had a pretty high number of in down. It was like 20% compared to like 12%. And so its number needed to harm for just Clinda was 10.8. Again, most of the stuff is GI, but if you have an old person who has an abscess and you give them clindamycin, do you really want like an old person maybe with dementia to develop diarrhea who now has to be changed and now ends up getting some ulcer because they have diarrhea and they're not being adequately turned, cared for, and dried out? Same thing with children. Do you want to have your child running around with diarrhea and having to change their diaper all the time? Does not sound fun to me. <laughs> And as with any RCT, they're kind of artificial. Most of them aren't pragmatic. Some are, but the problem with pragmatic studies is you don't get to control as well the intervention. They give everybody a pill pack. I don't think our patient's fill rate is that high for a lot of these prescriptions. So that's one thing to think about. Like, are people actually even filling prescriptions that we're giving them? They had non, pretty high non-compliance in their entire groups. Um, whether that was because they weren't tolerating the antibiotics or they developed some other infection that went somewhere else and that's why they were lost. It's hard to know. They don't tell us whether or not the patients had recent MRSA exposures. They don't tell us, you know, they don't give us that population breakdown. They don't tell us they have recent antibiotic exposures for even just like pharyngitis. So I think there's a few spots that are kind of missing there and they're different types of treatment. They don't talk about the drainages. So I think we should kind of question whether or not this is what we're practicing and if it's what can be practiced even. So I think in summary, we probably shouldn't be giving MRSA covered antibiotics to most people uh, who have a simple, uncomplicated abscess. I think the classic IND is still the way to go. Um, it only benefits like 50% of your patient population. If you maybe have a higher MRSA prevalence, you know, that shifts where your break-even point might be. There is still a decent amount of harm in both of these medications. TMPSMX may be lower GI stuff, but you have these risks over larger dosing, which we have so many abscesses, that you will probably have more C. diff, you'll have some Stephen Johnson, you'll have D6PD. Clinda, you're just going to have a lot of diarrhea. So a lot of kids and a lot of old people having diarrhea. It's distal sites mostly that we're talking about, not the original lesion, especially in down tailing, does show improvement, like statistical difference in the original lesion. The meta-analyses use per protocol numbers, not the uh, intention to treat. And a lot of people are lost in these studies. That always has to make you question and uh, like the, actual, the actual veracity of any claim from any RCT. They do a lot of loss to follow-up or people that were removed from the study for a variety of reasons. And all the failures were pretty much minor. Nobody re really required hospitalization for a treatment failure. They just needed to have antibiotics added on or an IND. And if you're worried about colonization, you should get the whole family to decontaminate, to decolonize with mucorosin, <clears throat> nasal swabs, bleach fats, that's probably better than giving people antibiotics who are asymptomatic and, you know, just have a chance of harm. So I don't think the decolonization is a thing. That's, that's my point. Don't antibiotics all uncomplicated abscesses. If everybody would like to take a moment, uh, Gina and I prepared the same uh, survey that we sent to all the attendings. And you can fill this out now and you can see if you guys have changed your opinions or if you just agree with the attendings.
In the meantime, any questions or comments? Uh, so let me ask, so um, no, no antibiotics ever, I mean, unless they're like sick or <laughs> So I think that was one of the things that Gina and I together wanted to discuss. Um, I think if you have somebody who's like an IBDU, there was some evidence for like increased, like erythema does seem to increase the likelihood that you'll have a benefit from antibiotics. So if there's associated cellulitis, that's something that might shift towards that. Um, if you have a history of MRSA infection, you know that their family member has a MRSA infection. Again, it really benefits people who have MRSA. I would, you know, ASAP and IDSA say don't culture uh, your normal uncomplicated abscess. So if we're not doing that and you don't know they have MRSA, I don't know if you're benefiting patients. Theoretically, I suppose you could nasal swab people and if they have MRSA, you could send an antibiotic prescription later. But for the healthy person who's not immune compromised, who has an uncomplicated abscess, who you don't have like a high risk factor for MRSA, I don't think it's going to benefit them. What about you, Gina? What, where, do you, where do you stand? Antibiotics for everybody? Yeah. I think it's also I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, I've, uh, you know, we always thought, I was always taught to do IND and don't have to do anything else unless they're like sick or diabetics, immunocompromised. But then those two studies came out and really made me question that. Um, it didn't make me want to give antibiotics to everybody. It just makes me have the lower threshold to actually give the antibiotics. And I don't have a good cutoff. I really just go by gut onto who am I gonna give antibiotics to? I don't do it a lot. And I think, um, I really agree. I mean, if you read the NNT on this, it's a really great NNT. And it's basically kind of the same conclusion. It's like, you probably shouldn't give antibiotics to everybody, but you should probably have a lower threshold to do it. But realizing that the risk of antibiotics and that's, you know, complications and all that other stuff, it, it, and, and, and in addition to just throwing more antibiotics in the world is probably bad for the world in general. So I think, you know, we probably overuse antibiotics as a specialty as a whole. So we should always try to avoid it. You know, the, the bad outcomes of these patients are not the terrible outcomes. It was like longer healing times. Maybe maybe somebody had to go to the OR for drainage. I don't know. It's hard to know because they don't really give us the details. Like maybe they made a small incision the first time. And, and I think um, my push from all this is, we should be culturing every abscess you drain just so we know what's in our community and you know what, if they come back, what you're going to treat them with. I think that's going to be, that, that can be really helpful. I do not give um, cephalosporins, Keflex, the first generation cephalosporins, to any of my abscess patients. I think once there's pus, you have to assume there's MRSA. And I, and I don't give Clinda because this studies and all the other studies have ever involved Clinda. Clinda always has the worst side effect profile. So you just think about what you're doing to your patients. But you're, the, the, the worst possible side effects with TMPSMX. Yeah, but those are rare. Small it, it happens, right? But I mean, I had a guy a few weeks ago who had a really bad drug reaction to Bactrim, you know, with rash. And, 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 but he was, it wasn't even I, Stephen Johnson, which is a bad drug reaction. Yes, that does happen with Bactrim, but more often than not, you're going to have the GI stuff and the other side effects of Clinda. And you know what the back right. is rare, so I always default to back. Like, it is, I think, on the beers criteria, like beers list, not to give to like elderly people as well. TMPS and that, so that's something to also consider. But diarrhea in a person with dementia, as I said, is probably not a good thing either. Are there else? What are the other? I think we can transition to. Okay. So this is we have a few responses. But I think this just shifted even a little bit stronger. I think people didn't hear, we didn't talk about uh, cephalosporins, but uh, Dr. Schechter actually mentioned this a little bit and the evidence for cephalosporins is pretty bad. And so even if there's overlying erythema, that still should probably be, if you're going to antibiotics them, um, you should probably give them MRSA coverage uh, and not give them just cephalexin. Um, just as a note, because we didn't mention that at all, but if you do want to antibiotics them because they have overlying erythema, give them, you know, MRSA coverage antibiotics. Don't just go with cephalexin. 
And then, yeah, IBDU, I think we all probably agree this person does require um, antibiotics. You have to treat anybody who's IBDU with an SSTI as being really serious. And, you know, these are people who even more so, you know, following what Dr. Schechter said about culturing all of these, like sending a culture on this person is probably even more important because they have high risks of developing like endocarditis and other complications. Um, So the erythema, again, it does seem to maybe push, and I think it was uh, tailing down a little bit towards maybe some benefit, but culturing, and if they have no risk factors, I think you can just get some erythema just from overlying, and the failures, if you do fail, are pretty minor, and so you can always have a wound check and see if they're improving the antibiotics, but that does definitely push people towards a little bit more giving antibiotics. And again, sick person with, you know, probably a little immune compromised. People are still going towards giving. And then we're pretty split for the recent antibiotic prescription. Um, and then the MRSA coverage. With recent MRSA infection, everybody's still pushing towards MRSA antibiotics. Right, thank you. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, just a couple comments from the chat. Dr. Silverberg. Kind of mention also like a good IND is the the primary treatment so making sure that you also get those pockets of abscesses is important uh, which kind of goes to what Dr. Schechter was saying we don't know exactly how well the IND was done and then Ritvik says although it was not among the medications that was cited in the studies that Noah and Gina mentioned you can consider giving patient patients doxycycline and that's also in the IDSA guidelines as well. Yeah they specifically say that in the in the systematic review meta-analysis and I think in, maybe it's down that they don't look at that something to consider, but there's no data for it. Okay. It's all awesome. TMPSMX. Okay, awesome. All right, good job, guys.